Hello, I'm John Gerke. I'm a professor in the Geological and Mining Engineering and Sciences Department at Michigan Tech. I'm going to give you a quick tour of the awesome rocks that we have around the department. Uh, I'm going to start and stop the video here and there because they're sort of spread out throughout the building. So I have my hand here for scale. That's 100% copper. That is iron ore. So copper was found in two kinds of rocks here, two types of rocks. Basalt, amygdaloidal basalt. The amygdaloidal means spaces. And then conglomerate, and conglomerate is a rock made up of mixtures of rock. There's no copper in this specimen here, but it's beautiful rock nonetheless. But here you can see copper, and you can see the copper is in these areas that were once spaces in this rock. So basalt is lava that cools and forms rock. And when it cools, the gases come out and, and some of them get trapped and leave a space behind. And then later fluids came and, and permeated these spaces and the copper that was dissolved in the fluids precipitated out in elemental form. So you can see the copper, which is beautiful, huh? More rare is finding copper in other kinds of rocks. So this is a rock that is a sandstone and it's found about 40 miles southwest of here in the White Pine Mine. And when we get close, you can see in the spaces in the sandstone, this video doesn't do it justice, it's beautiful here in person, is about 50%, almost 50% copper. Although iron wasn't found here in the Kiwada, near the, where Michigan Tech is, but about 100 miles away it can be found. This is iron, banded iron formation. In specular hematite, I'm going at an angle here to try and reduce the reflection from the lights. Look how beautiful that sparkles. Again, it's iron ore. So here's a map of the Kiwana. Michigan Tech is right here, right there. And you can see the sort of the surface texture of the of the landscape and the, that's all defined by the underlying geology. So you can see a more rough part here, right? And more mottled part here. So if one was to dig a trench across the Keweenaw to the northwest all the way to Canada through Lake Superior, dig it really deep, like a mile, miles deep, and look at, get inside that trench and look at it at the side, it would look like this. And here's the Keweenaw side of it, and here is the Canadian side of it. And what these, what these formations are, are old lava flows. So the earth crust, and I'll show you some video of that, had split and the lava magma oozed up to the surface and flowed out as lava and then cooled. And then later another sheet of lava would uh, per, or flow across the landscape. And this, they're all stacked up. And then with time, they sank, and the ends got pushed up. And so what you're seeing on the Keweenaw are these edges of each of these lava flows. And that's what you're seeing right here. Each of these is the edge of a lava flow. And then if you've ever been out to Isle Royal, oops, sorry, right there, you're seeing the same lava flows with the other edges of them. The rock here is Jacobsville sandstone. I'm going to show you some of that too, and it's used for different purposes. There is no copper in that, but there's, it's valuable none, nonetheless. So here's a geologic map of the Keweenaw. Each of the colors represent different rock types. So this is that Jacobsville sandstone. These are the lava flows, Keweenaw conglomerate, and then Frida sandstone over here. Okay. And then some of the mining activity is occurring over here that's ongoing. This is uh, where the Eagle Mine is, north of Marquette. These are some intrusive dikes down here. If you came to visit, I'd show you this map too, another geologic map. So a geologic map is a map of what the underlying geology light is like if one was to dig down through the soil to the first exposure of rock. So again, here's the Keweenaw, and you can see here that colors here represent different geologies. It's very different than the rest of the United States. 
And that's because we are in what's called a mid-continent rift. It's a part of the continent that got that split open and magma squeezed up to the surface and flowed out as lava. And then later fluids came and deposited important metals and minerals that we, that were mined and, and we still continue to mine to this day. The lower part of Michigan and the eastern side of the Upper Peninsula is part of what's called the Michigan Basin. So this is a marine environment where there are alternating layers of sandstone shales and limestone. And the conditions there were conducive to producing petroleum. And so that's why the petroleum development activities, natural gas and oil, are produced in lower Michigan, but we don't see it over here. All the, the rocks here were before life was on, on Earth. And then and when you cross the Mackinac Bridge, you'll see exposures of the limestone here. Well, this limestone is the same limestone that follows around Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. So we have rocks everywhere, uh, displayed everywhere because we have a lot of interest in them. You can find a lot of these online. We'll provide some links to this. Uh, I mentioned this basalt. So basalt, again, is, is lava that's cooled and formed rock. And then the picture at the top shows some, some uh, pictures of the exposed basalt on Isle Royal. And then these are some s specimens. And I mentioned that, that uh, spaces in basalt, that kind is called amygdaloidal basalt. And so these are just pieces of this. This is what we find on the beaches. And it was in these spaces that minerals were deposited and copper was deposited. There's other kinds of basalt, so here's another type that I have a hard time pronouncing, uh, but it has interesting textures, and I'm sure many of you have seen, at least those of you in Michigan have seen rocks like this. This is another kind of rock we often see on beaches and in rivers in the Upper Peninsula and in Canada. They're called omars. So these holes, many of you found rocks like this on the shore and with these holes in them. Um, these form as a result of um, concretions that were cemented inside the rock and then eventually those concretions get eroded out and leaving a hole behind. So concretion is a rock that forms as a result of, so it's sort of soft, it gets compressed and hardened into a, a, a rock that's not very durable and then washes out later. So I'm going to show you some rocks now that give a, a depiction of what our majors do when they graduate with a degree in geology or geophysics or geological or mining engineering. Uh, and I'm going to do that in terms of this really impressive rock. So I want to get you up close and see it. This is polished here so you can see the textures. And, uh, if you were here in person, this would look very gold to you. Um, just like gold, but it isn't gold, of course. It's and the next best guess would be fool's gold, which is pyrite, and that's an iron sulfide. And this that would be a pretty good guess because this is a sulfide, but it's not an iron sulfide. It's a copper nickel sulfide. And I'm going to show you how this is formed. So here's a schematic showing the mant Earth's mantle, and the copper and nickel content of the mantle is one or two percent. Um, if we could drill down or mine down to it, that's not enough to make it feasible. Uh, but there are places where, uh, of course, like in volcanic systems where the, the mantle oozes up to the surface or gets squeezed up and forms in, as lava and travels through cracks and along faults and in two in spaces. And, and um, that lava carries with it the copper and nickel that's part of the, the mantle. Well, as that copper and nickel gets to the, that mixture gets to the surface, the temperature and chemistry changes and the copper and nickel don't want to be dissolved anymore in the, in the magma and they, they precipitate out as a sulfide, um, copper sulfides and nickel sulfides. And so that's what forms this. And so they accumulate here and form a rich deposit that might be 6% copper and nickel or higher, and that's what makes it valuable to mine. These kinds of deposits 
even though we knew about volcanism, we know that copper and nickel exists in the mantle. Um, these kinds of deposits weren't known before until about 1999, uh, where they were discovered in, in Labrador, Canada. And so geologists then took that information and extrapolated where other places that we might find that. And then, and to do that, um, what we know is that these are very rich and small deposits that um, are hard to find. So to find them, we do aeromagnetic studies, that's a geophysicist, and they fly over the surface of the earth and measure the um, magnetic field, and plot it up and look for anomalies, and then go and drill those anomalies to look for these kinds of deposits. So when they drill it, they get core. Here's some core. This core would be approximately two inches in diameter. And they would drill a length of core, maybe 20 feet or 10 feet, um, and then uh, bring that to the surface and cut it and put it in, the bo in boxes, and then sample this for further analysis. So here are some images, microscopic images. So these are blown up one centimeter for scale. And you can see these minerals that appear in the rocks and then are, we determine the, the value then of the deposit. So a combination of geophysics to discover it and drilling to map it and then we figure out the, the value and extent of the resource and then engineers figure then design a mine shaft that goes down to mine out and a way to operate and extract the ore. And so that'd be mining engineers or geological engineers would be involved with this design. So that's one example of what our, our majors do. So the geophysicists help discover a deposit, a geologists helps characterize it, and then engineers look design systems to develop the resource and to do so in a way that's safe and protects the environment. We have more rocks here outdoors and some really beautiful specimens. Uh, we have a whole garden of boulders that represent the rocks of the Keweenaw and, and other boulders that flew here as a result of a meteor impact. Uh, but every, unfortunately it's snowing right now and, uh, and so everything, all these rocks are covered up. Uh, so if you come visit in the non-snow months, we can go out and take a look at them. Alright, so we're going back to where we had started. I'll just show you a couple other really awesome rock specimens. That Here's that Jacobsville sandstone. That's uh, up here. Many of the banks and old churches are made from this. It was quarried from the town Jacobsville just a few miles from here. This is a piece of a brick from a smelter. And copper replaced some of the the uh, minerals that were in the brick, clay minerals, and amygdaloidal basalt, dolomite. So if you live near Marquette or drive through there, you'll see that rock. This is pretty cool. Looks sort of like ice. That's salt. It's from the Detroit salt mine, about 1,100 feet underground. Not sure I can. You can see this very well. There's a fluid inclusion trapped in there. It's a, like a bubble, and when I tilt it, you can see there's a gas bubble in, trapped with it. So that is you know, a couple million years old, more than that. So those salt forms by the evaporation of seawater, and there are these thick layers of salt that underlie the southeastern part of Michigan and are mined for road salt and industrial purposes. So we have more to show you, and if sorry you couldn't come to preview day, well, there's a small consolation here for that is uh, this video. And so we have a couple more videos to show you, and um, of some of our labs, not all of them. Uh, a lot of the things that we do, we do outside. So this is, uh, we're sorry that uh, can't do that right now, but. Uh, if you come to visit in the summer, we'll show you the, uh, some of the awesome geology that's around campus. Thanks for watching.